special senses um, is going to be the conclusion of the nervous system. Um, and as I mentioned, this is the majority of chapter 14, although not all of it, because they threw in all the sensory stuff, um, which I, to me is weird. I like having a separate special senses chapter. So that's why I've made it a separate lecture. So it's kind of picked out um, and uh, collated. So we're gonna run through all five special senses. We're gonna start with the easy ones and work our way to vision, which is by far the most complex. Um, so remember we talked about before that special senses all use um, specific localized uh, sensory organs. And that's what makes them special senses as opposed to generalized senses, right? And they're only in certain locations and all of them are on the head. So we're gonna go through taste, smell, hearing, um, equilibrium, and then vision. So equilibrium is the only one that is not routinely recognized as a special sense, right? When we're kids, we're taught like, oh, we have five senses. It's taste, smell, hearing, vision, and touch. But touch is a general sense and equilibrium is just as important as everything else. So that's where that comes from, and for all the same reasons why the other guys count as special senses. So starting with taste and smell, um, we clump them together because they are both chemical senses. So their, uh, key, uh, hmm, their receptors are chemoreceptors. They're more specialized than the other ones we have in the body, um, but because we're detecting chemicals, um, those chemicals actually have to be dissolved in solution in order to bind to the receptors. And so even though we smell stuff from the air, it actually has to dissolve into nasal secretions before we can smell it. And then um, our mouth has to be wet with saliva in order for us to taste stuff. So if your mouth was completely dry, you wouldn't be able to taste something on your tongue until you got it wet. Um, now, they're, although they both use chemoreceptors, they respond to different classes of chemicals and they exist for different purposes. So we'll start with taste because it's a little bit more um, straightforward. Uh, so taste is of course so that we know what we're putting in our mouths, usually what we're eating. Um, and the receptors are located in specialized structures called taste buds, uh, which most of the time are on the tongue, most of the time um, within other specialized structures called papillae. Now we do have some taste buds in our soft palate, our cheeks, our pharynx, and our epiglottis as well. So taste does um, spread beyond the tongue, but the tongue is the primary location. So papillae are the bumps on the tongue that give it texture. And um, I'm sure there's various physical reasons for us to have those as far as, you know, eating and drinking are concerned. There's actually four different types of papillae um, and they're named for their shapes. So uh, the circumvalate or valate, just look like little hills. Um, foliate kind of look more like little leaves. Filiform or like more long and slender. And then fungiform look like mushrooms. And um, most of them have taste buds on them as well. Filiforms don't. So we don't care about them as much for our purposes. And uh, the different types of papillae are located in different places. So the fungiforms are the ones that are kind of scattered all over the surface. The valate or, or circumvalate, depending on which textbook you use, are the big guys sort of at the back of the tongue. Um, the uh, filiforms are usually sort of on the edge, but we don't really care about them. And the foliates are kind of on the sides. Now the taste buds are much, much smaller than the papillae. Pretty sure I have another picture. Yeah. So if the papilla is this big, see the taste buds are like that big. All right. Much, much smaller. So a taste bud is the official sensory organ of gustation, which is the fancy word for tasting stuff. Uh, they're composed of 50 to 100 epithelial cells. So we have these specialized sensory cells that are then going to synapse with our sensory receptor neurons. Okay, 
or our sensory neurons. Uh, the ones that actually do the tasting are the gustatory epithelial cells or taste cells. So they're the ones with the receptors for different kinds of chemicals. Um, we have three different kinds of taste cells based on how they interact with a sensory neuron, and we don't have time to go into the detail for that. There are also basal epithelial cells that we think act as stem cells to replace our taste cells when they get damaged, which, you know, happens fairly often, right? I'm sure you've burned your tongue or something and couldn't quite taste everything right for about a week and then they came back. So they're pretty rapidly regenerating which is nice. And then at the base of a taste bud, we have the sensory dendrites of the first order sensory neurons. So they just kind of like coil around the um, taste cells. Like, so it kind of, they kind of look like onions or like garlic or something. So if you look at this, the epithelial cells are in here and um, each epithelial cell, each taste cell, has little microvilli that stick out the top, and the only way that chemicals get in is actually through the tiny hole at the top called a taste pore, which is very weird, but whatever. So the receptors are all here, and then um, the various sensory neurons, their dendrites run up here, and they're hanging out at the bases. And so then there's gonna be synapses, chemical synapses, between the dendrites and the taste cells. And you can see that this is kind of showing the different types of papillae. So these dendrites are coming in to the base of each taste bud. You see that? So they're on the sides of the circumvallates and I don't know which one's which over here. It doesn't matter. And then the top of these guys, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Um, so some interesting things about tasting. Um, the density of taste buds in the mouth does vary between individuals. And um, we kind of split people into three categories based on their sensitivity of tasting. So um, this was stuff that they kind of worked out um, probably about 50 years ago or so, you can read these articles if you're curious, um, that some people could taste a couple of different chemicals that other people couldn't. Um, those people got categorized as super tasters. And so they have the highest density of taste buds. And a lot of foods taste very bitter to them because they literally just have more receptors. And so it doesn't take as much of any particular chemical to trigger a taste. So they can often be very picky because things literally just don't taste good for them. Um, so they're not like just being whiners, like it really does taste bad. Um, some people have very few taste buds, so we call them non-tasters, and a lot of foods taste bland to them. They frequently like really spicy foods. They like to put a lot of like Tabasco sauce and other stuff on there because it's just, otherwise nothing tastes very good or very strong. But honestly, most people are in between and have like a moderate amount of taste buds. And so they can appreciate most foods, but they don't need a lot of heavy spices. Thank goodness. Pretty sure my sister's a super taster, you guys, because she's picky. Um, all right. So we learn that, like when we were kids, we learned that there was like four things we could taste. And, and we've added five. Um, and the, the different types of taste that we can experience are called modalities. So each modality um, uses different chemicals to trigger different receptors. So we can taste sweet, um, and this is typically triggered by monosaccharides and disaccharides, so simple sugars, which, you know, what we think about as sugar, um, but alcohols, some amino acids, and some of the so-called artificial sweeteners or you know, Splenda, they don't, or not, which one is it? Whatever, the one from the plant, it doesn't matter. They don't like to call it artificial because it's from a plant, but whatever, it tastes sweet and it has no calories. So to me, that's, that's all the same category. So they all trigger the receptors, so therefore they all taste sweet, all right? What we identify as sour is actually triggered by acids. So literally the hydrogen ions are what trigger the receptors. Um, salty is, of course, triggered by metal salts, 
and that sounds bad, but that's just like sodium chloride, potassium chloride, other things. Sodium chloride has the strongest effect. That one's important because obviously we need a lot of it. Um, bitter is triggered by a category of molecules called alkaloids, as well as some things like aspirin. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, the more recent one to be added on is called umami. This is considered a savory flavor. And um, this is mostly amino acids. We associate this with high protein stuff. Um, the amino acids glutamate and aspartate are what typically trigger it. And glutamate is what MSG basically is. It's monosodium glutamate. It's, a, it's the salt of it. And so that's literally why adding MSG to things makes it taste meatier. And there is no evidence that that's bad for you. So go for it if you like it. Now, the thing is that research is ongoing. It turns out there's seven modalities. Um, I double checked. So um, lipids actually can be detected by our taste buds. Um, triglycerides and fatty acids seem to trigger it. Um, we're still not 100% sure what the implications of that are. There's a lot of research, but we know for sure that like we can taste lipids and rodents can taste lipids and um, yeah, it makes sense. And then the other thing that um, we figured out fairly recently is that we can taste a uh, larger saccharides. So we can taste larger carbohydrates. So people have always thought, you know, like, oh, something tastes starchy, right? Like have potatoes or bread or something and it tastes starchy, like it, you don't have to wait until it tastes sweet. So we have the enzyme amylase in our saliva and it starts starch breakdown. And even before we break them down into mono and disaccharides, um, so we call those glucose oligomers, we can actually taste those. So yeah, again, we don't know 100% the implications of all of that, but at some point the textbooks will catch up and then they'll finally be like, yes, there's seven. And for all we know at that point, there'll be eight, I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen. So a little bit more detail on the ones that we feel very comfortable with. So like I said, um, sweet is all about simple carbohydrates. Um, and that makes sense, of course, because before we had commercial food production, foods of high color value were going to be really valuable, right? Um, we wanted to be stimulated to eat things that were going to be very nutritious uh, because they were going to be hard to come by and starvation was way more likely than obesity. So that's why we have sweet to encourage us to eat fruit, basically. And raid honey, uh, raid beehives. Um, sour, so that we eat citrus and get enough vitamin C. And also so that don't, we don't eat things that are too acidic, because that would be bad for us. Um, salty, so that we actually take in enough electrolytes. And we know that um, if you crave salt, it is often linked to electrolyte deficiencies. Um, bitter is actually, the reason why um, you don't necessarily like the taste of bitter is because things that are bitter are most likely to be spoiled or toxic. So we're not actually supposed to like bitter. We're supposed to avoid things that taste bitter. Um, but of course, we have developed a fondness for a whole category of bitter tasting things in complete defiance of that defense mechanism. What are you going to do? right? Because coffee's bitter, a lot of beer is bitter, other things, right? Tea is bitter, all that stuff. So alkaloids are the bitter tasting compounds that we are supposed to be avoiding because they're very frequently um, toxic and will hurt you. Um, umami, as I said, is uh, described as savory and um, it's from the Japanese and uh, yeah, it makes um, meat and other um, high um, protein things taste good. Um, these are all different things that will trigger umami. I was trying to find good visuals. It's kind of cool to look at stuff like that. So obviously meat, um, amino acid inosinate, um, uh, mushrooms for guanolate, and then glutamate makes um, some mushrooms, cheese, and then some vegetables and seaweed taste like that. Um, the idea that different parts of your tongue taste different things is completely false. Pretty much all your taste buds should taste everything. 
So there's no specificity of location to any of this. Myth busted. Um, the way this works then is we're stimulating that first receptor and then we're sending signals into our brains. So um, remember that three different cranial nerves carry taste from different parts of your tongue and oral cavity, but they all end up in your brain stem. So here's our first order synapsing with our second order neurons. Um, in the medulla and then some of them uh, are gonna um, synapse here in the pons and some of them are going to go up to the thalamus synapse and then go up to your cerebral cortex and then voila we eventually become aware of what we're tasting yay any questions all right so smell fancy word is olfaction it's very similar to taste um, but now we're trying to detect airborne chemicals rather than the things we put in our mouth and although we might not have um, sh as sharp as a smell as other species because we literally have a smaller area of, um, of uh, olfactory epithelium in our nose um, and a relatively small area um, in our brain um, we're still pretty good like we're actually not that bad um, they, we estimate that people can detect up to about a trillion different scents, which is pretty crazy. Here's the article. <clears throat> so the way it works is it's just a little area of your nasal cavity that actually has this specialized olfactory epithelium. It basically covers the superior nasal conchi. Okay, so posterior, superior. Let me move back there. Um, and the sensory receptors in this case are actually the sensory neurons. So unlike taste, where we have specialized sensory cells synapsing with first order neurons, now the first order neuron is the sensory receptor. And then they have supporting cells and there's stem cells in there too, because these guys also have pretty fast turnover. And they're actually making up the epithelial membrane of that part of the nasal cavity. The rest of the nasal cavity is going to be made up of respiratory, uh, respiratory epithelium and just be like ciliated pseudostratified stuff. So we call them olfactory receptors. They're bipolar neurons. Um, the receptor region has specialized dendritic endings called olfactory cilia. Now the axons are actually non-myelinated and they travel in little bundles through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. So, this is actually technically the olfactory nerve. There's never a single little guy traveling through. So then the, they synapse in, um, in the olfactory bulbs and then that goes in and we'll talk about that later. Um, so while other species have much larger olfactory epithelial areas and they devote a larger proportion of their brain to um, to smell, like dogs are of course a great example, they have excellent senses of smell. Um, there have been studies showing that if we actually get on the ground and try to smell stuff like dogs do, we do pretty well. So they did one where they like blindfolded people and had them smell, um, had them track something with chocolate on it, and they're actually pretty good at, at following it, which kind of makes you want to run that experiment, you know? Um, but dogs are pretty amazing, so there's an article about that too. Um, and then there was one paper where they thought maybe rats could smell x-rays, just super weird. Um, but I double checked and there was no follow-up. They did like one study in 1965 and they know that exposure to x-rays will change rat's sense of smell, but we don't actually think they smell x-rays. We think it just changes the way they smell. Anyway, it was weird and, um, somebody made this gif, but I don't think it's actually true. So fun times. All right, so here's our pathway. So here's our little bipolar neurons sticking their dendrites out. The support cells are basically just these columnar ciliated guys. And we're gonna make some mucus here because we have to have a nice little nasal secretion, right, to dissolve the odorants. That's what we call things we smell, is odorant. I think I have it written down somewhere. So then they go through the cribriform plate. So this is our actual olfactory nerve. They enter the olfactory bulb and they synapse. So now these second order neurons 
go down the olfactory tract and they'll, they'll get somewhere. We'll get to that later. Okay, so immediately synapse. So we really never see this. All right, I said that. I got to stop doing that. Um, oh, yeah. So um, the stem cells typically replace the neurons every 70 days. So our sense of smell gets totally renewed um, every two plus months. And the, I didn't write it down, but I, it's about every week, I think, that we replace our taste bud cells. So here's another close up of that. Um, remember that everything has to dissolve to be detected. And of course, we're going to have mucus being produced too. So um, the odorants are any chemical that is capable of being detected by an olfactory receptor. Um, so we have about 400 genes for different receptors, but they're able to recombine them so that we're able to detect a bunch more. And then the um, a lot of them are stimulated by combinations of chemicals, and that's how we can estimate that we can detect up to a trillion different smells, not because we have a trillion receptors, but because of the combination of stimulation. Now, our sensitivity to different odorants does vary, which means that the receptor density for different chemicals is variable too. Some things can be detected at really low levels, but some things need to be fairly strong before we can smell them. Interestingly, some things that we think we smell, actually, um, we are just feeling the sensations of pain um, and stimulation of temperature receptors in our nasal cavity. So things like ammonia, capsaicin, which is what makes things spicy, and methanol, they're actually triggering um, pain and or temperature receptors instead, which is weird, but kind of cool. So in order for something to be smelled, it has to start out as a gas, so we call that being volatile, but then it also has to dissolve in the mucus of your nasal secretions. And then of course, it's gonna have to bind to receptors, protein, so it's acting as a ligand, and binding is gonna open ion channels, and we're gonna generate graded potentials. If we have enough graded potential generation, we'll have an action potential, and that's what, is basically the minimum concentration of that particular odorant to trigger a sense of smell about it, right? Because we're getting, now we're getting signals. So as I said, the second order neurons are in the olfactory bulbs. So that's where we have our first synapse. Um, they are organized by um, the same kind of receptor proteins. So this is where we get organization of the, the types of chemicals that we're detecting. And then we're sending them to um, the cortex, um, uh, the cerebral cortex, um, and then it also goes to the frontal lobe, and then some of it goes straight to the hypothalamus and the limbic system. Now the interesting thing is that this is the only pathway into the brain that does not use the thalamus. So this is the least processed information that we get is the sense of smell. And that's why smell has such a powerful effect on memories, uh, memory triggers and stuff like that. Because first of all, a lot of it's going to the limbic system. So we know there's emotional triggers there. And second, because the thalamus doesn't get a say in, in um, processing. And that's because smell is a really old sense and a lot of other brain structures were built up after the fact, like around smell. All right, another picture of pathway, um, just to kind of summarize what I just said. And that one again, just in case we needed it, I wasn't sure, so I threw it in again. Anybody have any questions? All right, so chemical senses are pretty straightforward. It's gonna get a little bit more complicated from there. All right, so the ear is next, and there's two special senses in the ear. We have hearing and we have the vestibular sense, which is equilibrium. So we're able to detect sound and we're able to detect basically gravity is essentially what you're detecting there. So we're going to touch on um, the physics of sound and we have to touch on a bunch of anatomy to get how this works. So this is a little bit more complicated than just having chemoreceptors. 
All right, first off, sound. What is sound? Sound is actually vibrations of molecules through a medium. So they can be through air, they can be, um, or they can be in air, like traveling in the air, in the water. Um, we can have sounds passing through solids. The only time there's no sound is when there's no matter to vibrate. So there's no sound in a vacuum. So basically out in space, we're really not gonna have any sound transmission because there's very few molecules out there um, and they're very, they're very far spread apart, okay? Um, or as the GIF I saw recently said, um, sound is just molecules wiggling. And so musicians are just magical molecule wigglers. It went something like that. It was very hysterical. All right, so we're vibrating and we're actually alternating waves of increasing and decreasing pressure in the particles through which the sound is passing. So if we call it sound, that means that we can hear it, but any time that we have vibrations in, through a medium, it's technically sound, even if it's outside of our range of hearing. Um, so it kind of looks like this. When we have an increasing pressure, we increase the density of the molecules, and then the decreasing pressure, they spread back apart, and they increase and decrease and increase and decrease, okay? Um, and then this is my, my sound joke, because um, the premise of alien is that in space no one can hear you scream, because there's no sound in a vacuum. Um, but, you know, a, uh, radio waves will travel through space because um, they're light and not sound, actually. So, anyway, it's hysterical, but I feel rushed, so we're just going to go right on. Okay, so sound has different characteristics, and this um, applies to when we talk about what we're able to hear, too. So there's pitch, and then there's loudness. So pitch is the frequency of the sound. So high-pitched things, low-pitched things, right? Um, and it's basically about um, how, how many uh, cycles we have over time. So we measure pitch in hertz, which is cycles per second. The range that we can detect of pitch is 20 to 20,000 hertz. And where we are most sensitive, so where we can hear even very quiet sounds, is actually between about 1,500 and 5,000 hertz, which is where most human speech is. So that makes sense, right? So these are some visual examples of pitch. This would be a much lower pitched thing than this, right? So lower pitched things are when we make it lower, right? And then high pitched things like ultimate high pitched things like when you breathe in helium and talk, right? Like the chipmunks. So they would be like, right? Um, so things that fall below our hearing can still be detectable by other species. So elephants are particularly notable for being able to hear things below our frequency range. And um, this type of stuff, infrasound, um, sometimes we can feel it even though we can't hear it. So if you've ever been um, somewhere where you're listening to live music with a really uh, loud bass and you could feel it vibrating through your body. So just imagine being able to feel that when you couldn't hear it that's infrasound. Ultrasound is stuff whose pitch is higher than we can hear. Um, so the closest thing we can get, so the stuff that's at the very top of the range, um, which is actually what we usually can't hear any longer as we get older, that's one of the first things we lose. So that's like when you can hear an electronic device is on, you know, like if the TV's on, even though it's not broadcasting anything and you can hear that little high pitch ringing, that's just below ultrasound. And then animals like bats and dolphins, they can hear the really high stuff and they actually use that to bounce it off of things. And so we use ultrasound to make ultrasounds for you know imaging because those sounds will actually go through solid. So we can use that to you know do things like check um, women's pregnancies. We can look at the heart function. We can look inside. Um, and this is also what sonar is, that like submarines use, they're bouncing sounds through the water to see other solid things. So we do know about these things even if we can't hear them. 
The other characteristic of sound is how loud it is. And loudness is actually about the energy of the sound waves. So when we represent that by this wave thing, it's how high and low they go. So something like this is gonna be louder than something like this. So you can have something that's the same pitch, but it can be louder or quieter, right? Um, so we measure this in decibels. The weird thing about decibels is zero for decibels is the threshold of human hearing. So that means that things can be below the threshold of human hearing and be like negative decibels. And you could measure it with some sort of device, but we can't hear it, which I think is weird. Normal human conversation is typically good about 60 decibels and things that are loud enough to cause us pain from hearing them because they're, they're too much for our ears is about 120 to 140 decibels. And it's hard to find a really good visual of loudness, but obviously this is really loud, this is really quiet, and here's zero. So um, we actually can map out by looking at both frequency and loudness, which is represented as intensity here, we can map out the entire range of human hearing. So we hear best in the middle of our frequency range, right? That's what this is. So this is, we're really only going to hear really quiet things at our ideal frequency range. As we go towards ultrasound and infrasound, um, things need to be louder for us to be able to hear it. Um, and then you can see this is normal conversation, loudness, and pitch. So that's a nice little chart, how that works. Um, this is a little bit more of a comprehensive one comparing us to other animals. So like the reason why we can have things like dog whistles, where you have that whistle that you can blow that you can't hear but your dog hears, is because they can hear a much higher range than we can. So we can make a whistle that we can't hear, but they can hear. And so then you can use it to train them to come when you whistle. And nobody else needs to know they can't hear it. And cats are about the same. And apparently, moles hear infrasound, probably because they live underground. And um, lower pitch stuff travels farther than high pitch stuff. Um, this is the chart of comparing different sounds. Um, you'll notice that there's distances involved. So some things, um, some things are very close, right? Like this is conversational speech at a meter away is 60 decibels. That's not helpful. Um, if you're 50 meters, that's 150 feet from um, an, an aircraft, that's going to cause you damage. Right, so this is this is the danger zone here. This is this is the kind of things where you should be wearing hearing protection. Pretty much anything there. Well, okay. Anyway, there's lots of these charts. If you're ever curious. All right. So now that we've talked about sound, we're going to talk about ears. Ear anatomy is also more involved than the anatomy that we've already talked about. So the ear is actually divided into three regions. Now I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it because we're going to cover this in lab. I'm really just going to focus on the inner ear because that's where the physiology of hearing comes in. Okay. So this is our diagram. It corresponds really nicely with the anatomy stuff that we have for lab. Um, the outer ear is basically everything with skin on it. So this is called the oracle or the pinna. Um, this is called the outer ear canal or external ear canal or external acoustic meatus or it has like 8 million names. Um, this is the eardrum or tympanic membrane and um, inside of that is the middle ear. So then the middle ear is inside of the bone here, air filled space. This is where your ear bones are and then um, your inner ear is in here and it's actually um, tunneled into the temporal bone and it's got parts that we'll go over. So um, here's your outer ear stuff. You can refer back to it later. Um, your middle ear, like I said, it's filled with air. And there's actually a little tube. It also has a bunch of names, auditory tube, eustachian tube, pharyngotympanic tube, that actually connects each middle ear to your nasopharynx, so to your throat. And these are the ones that 
when you're going up and down an elevation, you know how your ears get clogged and then you have to like swallow or chew and then they pop? That's because you're moving air through this tube to equalize the pressure of the air inside your middle ears with the air in the atmosphere. That's that. Okay. Um, and so the big thing in here are the ear bones. Um, and their job is to transmit sounds that go into your ears through your tympanic membrane, and then they transmit them to the inner ear um, through something called the oval window. So the auditory ossicles are the ear bones. There are three of them in each ear, and they were named for what they thought the shapes looked like. So the malleus, because it kind of looks like a hammer, that's the one attached, or not attached to, but touching the eardrum goes here. And then um, the incus means anvil. It was kind of anvil-y shaped. That's next in the sequence. And then the last one is called the stapes because it looks like a stirrup. It's a stirrup iron like you would put on a saddle that you would ride a horse with. And actually it's quite accurate. That really is what that looks like. Kind of weird. Um, so that's that. And this guy is connected to that window into the inner ear. There's also two muscles in here that can tense up to decrease the vibration of the bones when things are really loud. All right, so that's middle ear. Um, those reflexive contractions are called the acoustic reflex. Um, and so one of them um, can, can contract when there's very loud noises. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work very well for sustained noises and stuff which is why you should still wear earplugs when you're in danger of damaging your ears. But there's some more information on that. And then, um, excellent. And then it turns out, I am not one of them, so I didn't know this until recently, but it turns out that some people actually have control over the tensor tympani muscle. If you're one of them, you may have known this. It also went viral like a month ago. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so they can actually tense the tensor tympani muscle and it makes a rumbling noise and that rumbling noise will actually drown out other sounds. I did not know this, but there are people that can literally tune you out if they don't want to hear you because they can make noises inside of their ears, which I think is hysterical. So anyway, here's your fun fact on middle ears. So that's here, and now we're going to go into what's going on in here. A couple different views if you need them. Yeah, okay. So the inner ear, it's also called the labyrinth because it's literally like this, this, this uh, maze-like tunnel inside of your temporal bone. So there's technically two layers to it. So there's the bony labyrinth or osseous labyrinth, which is literally the space inside your temporal bone for your inner ear. And then the membranous labyrinth is the soft tissue that lines the bony labyrinth and actually contains all of the structures that we're about to talk about. Um, between the bony and membranous labyrinths is a fluid called perilymph. And then within the membranous labyrinth is a fluid called endolymph. And we will talk about them in just a little bit. This is why I usually close the door. Okay, so that's what this looks like. So we always represent it as showing an outline of it, but the thing to remember is that the bony labyrinth is actually a space inside the bone. And there's three major structures to it that we'll talk about in a second. So there's the cochlea, the vestibule, and then these guys are called the semicircular canals. So the blue, excuse me, the blue stuff in here is the membranous labyrinth within the bony labyrinth. And then this yellow stuff is the vestibular and the cochlear nerves, which make up the vestibulocochlear nerve, one of the cranial nerves that you guys have to learn. So three parts to the labyrinth. Two of them are part of your vestibular sense, AKA equilibrium or balance. So the vestibule, which has two parts, the saccule and the utricle and there's a sensory receptor in each of those that we'll talk about later. And then there's three semicircular canals named for their orientation. So there's the anterior, posterior, and lateral canals. And they have ducts with sensory receptors in them. 
And then the cochlea is the one for hearing. So cochlea is snail because it literally looks like a snail shell. And there's three fluid filled chambers within the cochlea. So that's what we're going to talk about next. All right, so the way that the chambers work. Okay, so what I want you to think about is, so we have this bony tunnel, right? And within that bony tunnel, sure. So within the bony tunnel, we have a membrane. All right. And within that membrane, we have the sensory receptor for hearing. Okay. And we have perilymph between the bony tunnel and the membranous one. Thanks for that, cat. And then, um, yeah, sure, that works. And then we have the endolymph within. Okay. So then we take this and we coil it up into a snail shell. But whether or not we coil it, if we look at it in cross section, I can do this, hold on, it's a lot of, a lot of colors. If we look at it in cross section, what we get, second, so many colors, not help. Okay, so what we actually get is three different chambers. Okay, so the scale of vestibuli is the um, most superior chamber. It contains perilymph. All right, and we have a name for the membrane between the two, and we're not going to worry about that at the moment. Um, the scale of tympani is the inferior chamber. It also contains perilymph. It's technically continuous. They are technically a single continuous chamber, um, which I'll show you in a second. And then in the middle is the scala media. Media means middle. And it's also called the cochlear duct. And it contains the receptors for hearing as well as endolymph. So the fluid in there is endolymph. And then it contains a, the very, very long specialized structure that runs the whole length of the tube that actually does the hearing and the signal transduction for the hearing. So when we coil it up and then we slice it and look at it on cross section, we get a bunch of cross sections. All right. So here's the snail shell. Here's the tip of the snail shell. And um, it's called the helicotrema, just fun times. Um, you can see that the snail shell is made of bone with a bony tunnel running through it, right? So it's like you took this and you just kind of bored this out, okay? So scala vestibuli is running around and around and around. And then when it gets to the top, it's continuous. And then the scala tympani runs around and around and around. And then cochlear duct and scala media is in here with the actual, it's, it has a couple different names, but spiral organ is the one we're going to go with, um, actual sensory receptors for hearing. So then the cochlear nerve is connected to the spiral organ all along the length of this and ultimately sends a bunch of sensory neuron axons to the brain. That is our basic anatomy here. So the spiral organ is there for our highly specialized sensory organ of healing, hearing, Jesus. Um, the, uh, the membrane that it sits on is the basal membrane or basal or membrane. This is actually between the cochlear duct and um, Hold on. Just gonna, yep. And the scale is in Pani. Swear to God. And it's made up of cochlear hair cells. Those are the specialized um, sensory cells, as well as support cells. There's always support cells in these guys. There's two kinds of hair cells there's inner and outer, and they're um, 
it's based on the relationship to the center of that snail shell. I will show you that in a second. So this is that center again. So the inner hair cells are here and the outer hair cells are here. So this is the basilar membrane between the um, scala media and the scala tympani. And then, uh, why are you not labeled and why can't I remember? It doesn't matter. It'll come up eventually. And then this one also has a name. It'll come back to me. Um, and then the other thing that's part of the spiral organ is this tectorial membrane, which is like, um, it's like a gel hat. We'll look at it more in a second. Oh, the other, the older word for spiral organ is organ of corti. You will see that. One of those things we can't get rid of. Okay, so the hair cells are called hair cells because they have these, I believe they're actually microvilli, but we call them stereocilia. Either way, they have these little cellular processes that stick off the top and make them look like they have hair. And the tops of those are embedded in this tectorial membrane. And then the bottom of the cell has synapses with the dendritic processes of the first order neurons of this, you know, the sensory neurons of the cochlear nerve. I don't know why I put it here. I guess because it wasn't there yet. Anyway, um, autoacoustic emission. So your inner ears can actually generate sounds. I know that's weird because you think that they're supposed to detect sounds, but they can also actually generate sounds because all of this stuff can kind of vibrate. And um, you can actually measure them. And it's actually one of the ways that we determine whether or not babies can hear. Because if they are generating autoacoustic emissions, it means that they have normal ears. So anyway, fun fact on that. Um, I don't know why I put it there. I don't know why this is here either. I, oh, right, because I put them between the anatomy and the physiology. This has a lot of good stuff on it. I pulled a lot of pictures off of it, so I figured I'd give you the website. Okay, physiology of hearing. So now that we've established the anatomy and we will spell out some of the anatomy a little bit more as we go through, we're gonna look at how we actually transduce sound waves into electrical impulses. The entire ear is involved in hearing. So the reason we, why we have the pinna or auricle is to funnel sounds into our ear canal. And then the tympanic membrane vibrates in response to sound waves. And then the bones, the auditory ossicles, amplify those vibrations and transmit them to the fluid of the scala vestibuli. Oh yeah, it's just the vestibular membrane. That's what it's called. Oh my God, this upper one. Vestibular membrane, basilar membrane. Honest to God. So the fluid is vibrating and it will actually cross the vestibular membrane and cause the um, basilar membrane to vibrate and cause the hair cells to vibrate as well. Now, the tympanic membrane is really good at vibrating. The auditory ossicles are good at vibrating. The reason why they amplify it is because they're concentrating all the vibrations on that little oval window, which is a little membrane that connects up the, all, of the, all of the fluid filled cochlear stuff with the, um, you know, with the stirrup. Um, it's harder to vibrate fluid than air, right? It's harder to move fluid compared to air. So that's why we need to really amp up the vibrations. All right, so that's that. Anyway, so now the perilymph is vibrating and it transmits it through the scale of vestibuli. And at some point, depending on the frequency of the particular sound, it'll cross the vestibular membrane into the scala media and start vibrating the endolymph and the basilar membrane. So that's this whole thing that, that, I, that I drew. Um, and so like I said, so it'll cross over at some point, some of it goes all the way around and some of it goes and crosses over at a given point. It just depends on the frequency. So low frequency sounds will actually go all the way through the scala vestibuli go around the helicotrema, that, that point at the top of the cochlea, and then come back down the scala tympani 
and they'll vibrate the basilar membrane from underneath. And then the higher frequency sound will just cross parts of the um, vestibular membrane and go through the endolymph and vibrate the basilar membrane from the top. So either way, um, the basilar membrane is vibrating and all the vibrations travel all the way around and there's a little guy called the secondary tympanic membrane or the oval window, round window. Yeah, round window um, that bulges the fluid, which is how we don't get like buildup of pressure in there. That bulges, that relieves the pressure, everything keeps going. So the reason why it depends on the frequency is because the basilar membrane is not a uniform width or stiffness. It actually has a variable width and stiffness. Um, so it's kind of more shaped like this than it is like a straight strip. So um, different frequencies um, vibrate the different lengths. So there's stiffer fibers at the beginning near the oval window. Um, there's longer fibers near the cochlear apex. And that's why the, um, the higher, if I explain it right now, I'll mess it up. So the higher frequencies will vibrate the stiffer um, parts. And so that's why they cross over. And then the medium frequencies will go a little farther. And then the higher frequencies, because they are, um, are gonna vibrate the, the longer floppier ones, because it's, you know, it's such a slow wave. So they're gonna trigger them up here. And that's why we're able to detect different frequencies because our brain knows which impulses are coming from which part of the length of it. And um, so uh, that's one of the ways that we're able to detect different frequencies. And then the, um, the loudness is because of how, how much they're vibrating going to vibrate more when it's louder um, at that frequency. So there's, that's the, that. Um, now, how does that actually result in, um, you know, action potentials? Okay, so this is where the hair cells come in. So the hair cells are actually mechanoreceptors, as in it takes some, uh, a physical change to change you know, their, their electrical activity. So the stereocilia, if they move, they open mechanically gated ion channels. And that's gonna let ions in or not let ions in. So their um, polarity depends on whether or not these ion channels are open. And of course they will open when the basilar membrane starts vibrating. So, because all of this stuff is linked, as, they, as they're vibrating, this is staying still, and these guys are starting to move back and forth. And so as they bend, they open the, cha the channels, but then they bend back and they close them. So your brain is getting these pulsed signals, and the ions that are going in are calcium, um, your endolymph is really high in potassium. It's a very weird setup. Um, and we don't really need to know the details of it. There's a lot of details, but the bottom line is that these are individual hairs, um, stereocilia, and they're all linked together. There's these little linkers. And so they all will open and close as they're vibrating back and forth. Because remember, this is all frequency, right? So they're vibrating back and forth. So every time we have um, depolarization by letting the ions in, they're gonna release neurotransmitter across their synapse. And that's gonna cause a graded potential for the sensory neuron. And then every time they close, they actually hyperpolarize and then there's less. So the sensory neuron is getting these repeated pulses of neurotransmitter every time they bend one way and then nothing as they bend the other way and that encodes the signal that it's sending to the brain. Now, the signal is actually mostly getting sent by the inner hair cells. And so the majority of the nerve fibers are actually synapsing with them. The outer hair cells, their job isn't to detect the signals, 
their job is to change the stiffness of the basilar membrane in response to feedback signals from the brain, which let them fine tune our ability to hear different frequencies. And that's as much as we know about that, okay? So the pathway then that it takes is um, the, the first order neuron, if it gets enough graded potentials across that synapse to send action potentials, um, obviously sends it by the um, vestibulocochlear nerve, or as this weird one says, cochleovestibular, whatever, um, and it's gonna synapse. Now, half the information stays on one side, I believe, and half of it goes on the other side, but of course, we're generally gonna cross over. I can't remember where this one goes. Um, so we're synapsing in the brainstem, in the medulla, and then we're going up to um, um, the midbrain. This is where our auditory reflexes are, okay? So this is where, um, we talked about this last time, right? You hear a sound, you can automatically turn your head to it. Pretty sure we talked about that. Anyway, that happens here. Um, and then um, it goes up to the auditory cortex on either side, because we need to hear both. We hear in 3D, um, it's complicated. Uh, through the thalamus and to the auditory cortex, right at the top of the temporal lobes. All right, that's our pathway. Excellent. Um, Interestingly, there is an alternate pathway through the reticular formation, so there's some unconscious stuff, and that is tied to whether or not sounds can wake us up. It's tied to emotional responses to sounds um, and other stuff. Anybody have any questions? That's it in a nutshell. There's a lot more to the physiology, but we don't have time to go over. Excellent. Okay. So let's see what else is happening in the inner ear because we still have a fifth special sense to talk about. Um, even though we haven't talked about vision yet, I just call it the fifth because it's the one that always gets unrecognized, right? Like nobody pays attention to it, but it's literally why we know where our head is in space, okay? It detects gravity's effect on our head so that we know if our head is upright or down, we know if it's staying still, we know if it's moving. All of that is because of this sense of equilibrium or our vestibular sense. So we don't really need to spend too much time on the anatomy because we went over it already, right? It's the semicircular canals and the vestibule of the inner ear. So now we just looked at this, now we're gonna look at this, okay? Um, and then now we're dealing with the vestibular nerve rather than the cochlear nerve. Um, it's very, very similar in how it works. That's why they're all together. Um, but the functions are obviously a little bit different. So this is all a part of our proprioceptive input, and it's specifically for our head. Um, so we're tracking the position and movement of our head and neck, and we need it to change head position as needed. Um, when, um, when your vestibular sense goes wrong, bad things happen. There's some videos, feel free to watch them, um, including this really interesting one about, is that the interesting one about vertigo? There's a good one about vertigo in there somewhere. Um, vertigo is, can be caused by this going wrong because when you feel that dizziness, it's because your vestibular sense is not necessarily sending you accurate information. Now there's two types of um, input that we detect. There's static equilibrium and there's dynamic equilibrium. So static equilibrium is basically about where our head is with respect to gravity, and then it also monitors linear acceleration. So like if you're in a car and you start moving or you stop, um, you're aware of that feeling because of this static equilibrium, okay? Um, and we call it static even though there's movement involved in some of this detection because gravity is a constant and so it's, it's static. And that's as opposed to dynamic equilibrium which monitors changes in head rotation. So linear for static, it's just back and forth basically. I guess it technically goes side to side, I don't know. And then rotational is like this and like this, okay? If you're saying yes or you're saying no, you're engaging your dynamic equilibrium detectors. So the vestibule does static and the semicircular canals does dynamic. 
and it's dynamic because they're monitoring the changing conditions of rotating your head. So static equilibrium uses sensors called maculae. There's two of them because the vestibule is divided into two, the saccule and the utricle. And so each one has one macula um, and that should let us detect forward and back and, and think back and forth. And they're set up very similarly. So they're chair cells, they have stereocilia, and they're embedded in a jelly-like membrane. But this time, the membrane has little crystals on top. So it's called the otolith membrane because otoliths are, carbon, are calcium carbonite crystals that kind of look like little rocks sitting on top of a bunch of gel. So either way, the stereocilia are embedded in there. And so here is our little macula. And you can see the, um, the jelly-like membrane business is much thicker. So here's the otoliths. Otoconia is just another name for it. Um, with our little cilia embedded in there and then our hair cells. And there is apparently more than one type. Don't worry about that. It doesn't really matter, okay? So the mechanism is also going to be the same. Basically, there are mechanoreceptors in the cilia. When the membrane moves though, now instead of vibrating everything, we're just gonna move this big heavy membrane that's on top. So if you move your head, or if you're like in a car and you move, then the membrane is going to tilt it's going to bend the stereocilia. That's going to open the mechanoreceptors. And we're going to get a bunch more impulses. Okay, I have one more. Yeah. And then if you go the other way, it's going to close them and you get a lot less. And so then your brain knows like, oh, we're going forward or, oh, we're going back based on the increasing or decreasing frequency of the signals. Okay. Same concept used in a different way to give us gravity related information instead of hearing. So then the semicircular canals or the semicircular ducts are set up, the reason why we have three is because they're set up to represent the three dimensional space in which we're living. So there's two vertically oriented ducts at right angles to each other. So we've got the anterior and the posterior and the lateral semicircular duct. It sits about 30 degrees from horizontal, but basically we're representing X, Y, and Z planes, right? So the three planes that we always have. And so that lets us respond to rotation in all three different planes. Now, each one has a sensor called a cristae. Um, well, it's the singular is a crista ampullaris. And then um, cristae ampullaris is the plural. Very, very similar to the macula, except that now instead of like a gel thing with a bunch of crystals on it, we have this, it looks like a troll head, okay? Like literally. It's this um, ampullary cupula. Um, so again, we have um, hair cells and supporting cells and the cilia or the stereocilia are trapped in the top. Um, and just like, I didn't mention it for the last one, but just like before, the dendrites of the um, sensory neurons are at the base, right? And they're synapses. Um, the difference now is that whereas the last one, honestly, the endolymph didn't matter. So now though the endolymph is going to matter. So here's how it works. You rotate your head. The endolymph moves the opposite way, right? I got, okay, I've got very little water in here, but, but, but think about it. You can, you, you can demonstrate this with a cup of water. If I move the cup this way, the, the water temporarily sloshes back against the other side, right? And if I move it back, it, it, it sloshes back before it catches up right? We've all played with water. So what happens here is that you rotate your head. Um, the endolymph flows the other way first, and it bends the cupula in the opposite direction of rotation. And that's going to, again, either turn on or off the mechanoreceptors linked to the ion channels, and increase or decrease the signals. And your brain knows which way is corresponds to which. Now, this is also why if you spin and spin and spin, and then you stop, 
you still feel dizzy because the fluid is still moving and it's still bending these cupulas. So you're still getting a signal that you're rotating even though you're not until that catches up and stays still again. But it takes a lot, you know, to get it to get it moving. All right. So depending on which direction we're going to stimulate one of these three, although, you know, more complex movements are going to stimulate all of them. So once we trigger one of these neurons, um, all of them come together as the vestibular nerve. And that, of course, comes together with the cochlear nerve to be the vestibulocochlear nerve. So they all make their way to the brainstem like everybody else. Um, <clears throat> and then um, we're going to have some uh, synapsing in the brainstem. And then a bunch of this information goes to the cerebellum because the cerebellum really needs to know this, right? This is proprioceptive information about the head and neck. Um, and it's important for movement and posture. So the cerebellum needs to know. So this is one of the reasons why the, cere uh, why the, mm, why the pons has those massive cerebellar peduncles. And then the other information goes to a bunch of other places. Um, and then of course, some of it goes up through the thalamus to the cortex. And um, this is going to work with visual information and work with proprioceptors for the rest of the body to give the brain a sense of where the whole body is. And this link here, the fact that the, um, the brainstem and the cerebellum are constantly getting both visual input and vestibular input is one of the reasons why we get things like vertigo and motion sickness. Because if these don't line up, if they don't match each other, then our body, then our brain's like, oh God, like something's horribly wrong, you know, like I, I feel like I'm moving, but my eyes say I'm not, or vice versa. And then you end up like getting all messed up. That's a simplified version, but you know, it works. Um, and so to demonstrate that, um, this is actually a YouTube video, but the graphic is so nice. So if you wanna watch the video, you totally can. And then I found a nice little website on that. So if you're curious about vertigo or if you get vertigo, um, give it a go. Um, but definitely anywhere along that pathway, if it gets messed up, it can cause vertigo because that's the feeling of spinning when you're not actually spinning. Like that's literally what vertigo is. All right, any questions? It's really hard to cover all this in one go and I tried to cut a bunch of stuff out and it didn't work. So eyeballs and vision, also a little bit abbreviated. And also I'm gonna skip a lot of this anatomy right now because some of it's very straightforward and some of it we're gonna look at when we get in lab. And so I'm just gonna focus on the stuff we need for the physiology. Um, when we talk about the eye, we have to talk about everything about the eye. So we're talking about like the orbit and we're talking about, you know, eyebrows, eyelids, eyelashes, all this stuff. And we don't have time to talk about any of it. And it's unfortunate. Um, so like, for example, um, the conjunctiva is the mucous membranes that covers pretty much all of your eye that's exposed when your eyes open, except for your cornea. Um, I'll briefly talk about your lacrimal apparatus, which makes your tears. And we've talked about our extraocular muscles, so I just threw in one slide on that because we kind of covered that already. Um, so there's tons and tons of different eye things um, showing you all the different parts, okay? Um, we don't have time, again, for most of it. Um, here's your extraocular muscles, um, including nice little arrows that show you which way your eye moves when you activate them. And I just throw in as many of these things as I can find. Um, for lacrimation, that's production of tears. Um, we have a bunch of stuff. So basically, we have lacrimal glands. They're located um, in like the upper outer uh, corners of our eyes under our eyelids. Um, so their secretions are tears. We have a bunch of teeny tiny little ducts that let it release, and then it flows across our eye as a tear film. Um, and then it gets connect collected in the corners of our eyes. We have teeny tiny canals with teeny tiny holes um, that connect it. For some reason, it pools in the lacrimal sac, um, but then it flows out and empties 
in your nasal cavity by the nasal lacrimal duct. And that's one of the reasons why when you cry, your nose runs a lot because some of it's actually tears. Um, under ordinary circumstances though, your tear film is protecting your eye, has antimicrobial properties, um, it keeps it from drying out, and it actually provides nutrition for your cornea, or for the outer layers of your cornea at least. And there's actually several different layers to it. And your lacrimal gland isn't the only one that provides um, stuff. There's other little glands in your eyelids and stuff too, which we don't have time to talk about. Um, and here's the flow. Um, when we look at the eyeball itself, it's organized in kind of a weird way. So technically there's three layers of eyeball wall, okay? We call them tunics for some reason. We'll go through them in a second. Um, we also like to look at the anatomy of the eye in terms of the optical components, so all the things that let light in, because obviously that's important. And then there's neural components, which are the parts that are actually nervous system. So we're gonna talk about the tunics, and then we're gonna see which parts of that correspond to the optical and neural components. So tunics, um, there's an outer fibrous layer we call the tunica fibrosa. This is mostly connective tissue of the sclera, that's the white of your eye. And then it also includes your cornea, which is see-through and um, is the very front. And um, like I said, is the only part exposed that is not covered in uh, conjunctiva. The middle layer is the tunica vasculosa. Um, it's also called the uvea and it's mostly blood vessels. Lots and lots of blood vessels. Um, there's different parts to it and we'll kind of cover those. So the choroid is the most of it. Ciliary body is related to the lens. Um, I know you're familiar with the iris. And then the pupil isn't actually a thing. It's actually the hole in the middle of the iris, but we still like to talk about it as if it's a real thing. Um, and obviously that lets the light in too. And then the innermost layer is the tunica interna, or internal. Um, and this is all the neural tissue. So this is the retina and the optic nerve, and we'll talk about that in more detail in a little bit. Nope, hate when that happens. Okay, so um, tunica fibrosa, tunica vasculosa, and then uh, this yellow one is the tunica nervosa. And you can find all of that in lab as well. So the optical components, the important thing here is that it has to be transparent because if we don't let the light in, we can't detect it. Um, not only that, but they actually have to focus the images on the retina so that we can see clearly. And in order to do that, they do something called light refraction, which means bending, bending the light um, so that it's focused. And we'll talk about that part at the end. Um, the things that make up the optical components are the cornea, um, the aqueous humor is the fluid in the front of your eye. The lens, which separates the front of your eye from the back of your eye. And then the vitreous body is the fluid in the back of your eye, but it's actually more like another jelly-like thing. And it takes up most of the space of your eyeball. Um, the irritable muscles, so they're part of the uveal or um, vascular tunic. Uvea is the other name for all that. Um, and they're in charge of letting, controlling the amount of light that comes into the eye. So these guys are the autonomic nervous system controlled smooth muscle. There's a pupillary constrictor. It's controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. And then there's a pupillary dilator and it's controlled by the sympathetic. And we kind of talked about that already because that was PLR or per, um, the reflex that we talked about. So um, the uh, constrictor muscle is a sphincter, so it's circular. And then the dilator is a bunch of linear muscle from the edge of the iris um, in. And so when it constricts, it dilates everything. All right, so um, when we look at the inside of the eye, so inside of the three tunics, we actually divide up the eye into different chambers. And that's because there are natural divisions inside of the eye. So if you draw an eyeball, fine, we'll just go straight to the image. Uh, all right, so the lens 
and this is the ciliary body. So the ciliary body is smooth muscle within the, um, within the vascular layer. So the lens and the ciliary body divide up the eye into a um, posterior segment, which is everything back here, and an anterior segment, which is the stuff up here. All right, the posterior segment is what's filled with that vitreous jelly. And it's also all where the retina is. And then the anterior segment has two division has is divided into two as separated by the iris, even though the pupil means that they are continuous with each other. So the anterior segment is everything in front of the pupil contained by the cornea. And then the posterior chamber is basically everything around the front of the lens. Um, here's a really cool detail of the ciliary muscle. And you can see that the ciliary muscles are connected to the lens by these suspensory ligaments or um, zonular fibers. And then the iris is just an extension off of the ciliary muscle that covers the top. Um, and it contains, of course, those two muscles that we just talked about. And then you can see here's the cornea and the sclera. So they're all kind of connected up there. So the aqueous fluid that fills the anterior segment um, is actually produced by blood vessels in the ciliary body. And it flows through the posterior chamber, comes out the pupil, and then fills the anterior chamber where it nourishes the inside of the cornea. And then it drains out these little sinuses in the corners of your eye. And if you make too much here or you don't drain enough here, you get glaucoma. And that's your fun medical fact for the day. So the neural components then um, is the retina and the optic nerve. And the retina and the optic nerve are technically the only parts of the brain that can be viewed from the outside. So they're the only exposed portions of the brain, which is very interesting. Um, another weird thing is that even though the retina is basically a sheet of nervous tissue, it's only attached to the eye. So it's only attached to the underlying vascular layer at the optic disc, which is where the optic nerve comes out. So where all the axons are exiting the eye and the aura serrata, which is the um, outermost edge of the whole retina. The rest of it is not actually attached. It's just held in place by the pressure of the, um, the vitreous humor or the vitreous body. Um, and then the most important part of the retina is the macula lutea. Um, it means yellow spot because it looks like a yellow spot when you look at the back of somebody's eye. Um, which contains the fovea centralis, which has the highest density of um, photoreceptor cells, which we'll talk about in a second. So this is really where the majority of our sight is, is this one little spot in our retina, even though we have this whole giant retina. So um, there's a bunch of layers to this, and um, you're going to learn them in lab um, under your histology. We're not going to worry about too much of it. Um, but there is a pigmented layer, it's the outermost layer, and then beyond the pigmented layer is the um, vascular tunic. So, which at that point is the choroid. Um, and it's a single cell layer containing a whole bunch of melanin, as well as vitamin A. And its job is to support the photoreceptor cells and um, absorb extra light and then it eats the photoreceptor cells when they get old with phagocytosis. And then the neural layer is three layers of neurons and it is see-through. And when you see, light actually comes from here and has to go through the two layers of neurons to actually hit these photoreceptor cells. So there's photoreceptor cells here with their tops embedded in the pigmented layer and then there's a layer of bipolar cells, which are actually essentially your um, optic neurons. And then there's ganglion cells. And the ganglion cells are the ones whose axons go out to form the optic nerve. All right, 
So this is a, a picture of a fundus. So it's literally looking through your pupil, through your lens at the back of your eye. So this is looking at a retina. Your optic disc is here. Um, there's actually uh, blood vessels that come in the middle of your optic nerve. And so these are your uh, retinal vessels coming out of there. Now your macula lutea is here. And so your fovea centralis is in there. So this is where vision is actually occurring. And then this is actually your blind spot. So the only place you don't have um, photoreceptor cells is directly over the beginning of your optic nerve, which you can test at home if you want to, but we don't have time. Okay, so photoreceptors. So photoreceptors are modified neurons. So they're kind of like the sensory neurons, but also special sensory cells. I don't actually know where they fall. Um, so they're highly modified and they have visual pigments in their outer segments. Um, and as I said, the top of that is embedded in the pigmented layer. So they have this whole part that's just chock full of these visual pigments. And then the rest of it's more like a neuron. There's a cell body, and then there's a little axon and it synapses with um, the bipolar cells. Now, the, um, the visual pigment in the outer segment is what we really care about because that's the part that's really weird. There's two kinds of photoreceptors based on the shape of that outer segment, okay? So rods look more like rods and cones look like cones, okay? Um, there's one kind of rod because there's one kind of pigment and then there's actually three kinds of cones because they can have one of three types of visual pigments. All four of these visual pigments are a version of vitamin A called retinal and then one of a, um, a type of molecule called opsin. This is why vitamin A is important for vision literally in every single cell that detects light. So they look like this. You can see we've got rods and cones, and then there's three different colors of the cones because those are the colors that they're able to detect, and the majority of them are going to be located at that fovea centralis. Um, so we're going to slowly work our way through all the bits of information we need to deal with vision, and then we'll talk about that physiology. So when we're talking about vision and what photoreceptor cells detect, they are detecting what we call light, right? Light is actually electromagnetic radiation within a very narrow range of the full spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. And of course, the primary source of light is the sun, although now we're capable of generating artificial sources. Um, it's emitted from the sun as little packets of energy called photons. And those photons, just like sound waves, have different frequencies. So the frequencies or wavelengths are what determine whether or not we can detect it. And the wavelengths of light that we're actually able to detect is only 400 to 700 nanometers, which is very, very small. Um, if something is below less than 400, um, we call it ultraviolet light. And if it's above, we call it infrared. Pretty sure I didn't get that backwards. Yay, I got it right. So this is like the whole spectrum of electromagnetic radiation. And this is what we can see. Um, so things at higher wavelengths include ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays. And then um, things um, below or at a, um, at a longer wavelength than what we can see are infrared and then um, radar and radio waves. See, I told you radio waves were related to light. Radio waves are really, really long, so they can travel really, really far. These guys don't travel very far because they're very, very short, sort of. What a way to say it. Okay, so when we compare the visible light spectrum, that little narrow range that we can see, with the light that our different photopigments can detect, we get this chart. So 
um, our rod photopigment can detect, it's really good at detecting 500, that's like right in the middle, but it can detect a little bit all the way out here and a little bit all the way out here. See that, they all have ranges. And then the three types of cones. We've got blue cones, they're best over here, but they've got this range. Um, and then these are also, oh yeah, these are also our short wave cones. And then we've got medium or green, which is here, and then red over here, long. All right, so they all have peaks. They all have a wavelength that they are best at, and then they all have ranges, and you can see that the ranges overlap, okay? This is why we're able to see more than three colors, because even though we can only detect three, every single wavelength here is going to stimulate a different combination of these three cones. This is probably not when I should be talking about this, but this is when I'm thinking about it, and so we're talking about it. I know we've been going for a while. If all of your cones don't quite work, you're gonna have some form of color blindness. So um, this is kind of what the spectrum looks like if you only have two types of functional cones, which is the most common, um, red, bling, red, green color blindness. So it's not like you see black and white, it's just that you have trouble distinguishing certain things that other people can distinguish. Um, and this is the kind of way that we test that. So they make all these little charts um, it's really not good to test it on a computer. You really want the printed out ones because computers can have different specific color ranges and that could be deceiving. Just pointing that out. Um, some people actually have four, come on, um, four different types of cones and can actually see more colors than other people. Although we only have one person um, recorded so far that we're pretty sure can actually do that. Other people that genetically should be able to, as far as we can tell, can't see more than other people, but it is called tetrachromacy. It's the opposite of colorblindness, which is pretty cool. Um, here's the articles. This woman is an artist, so we think that's why she's really good at it. Um, but other species have tetrachromacy too. So birds have four types of cones and one of them can see in the ultraviolet. So they have a larger visible light spectrum range than we do. And they're not the only ones. A lot of insects can too. Um, so it turns out that like bird feather markings probably look a lot different to birds than they do to us because there's a whole other spectrum that we can be stimulating. Um, and a lot of flowers have different markings if you look at them in UV too. So we think that that's telling insects different things, um, like especially insects like bees who are, um, you know, uh, trying to find flowers. Super cool. All right, so a little bit on how that actually results in vision. So the photoreceptors, when they're not stimulated by light, are actually constantly inhibiting bipolar cells from firing. So they're actually, um, across their synapse, releasing inhibitory neurotransmitters, and the bipolar cells are kept quiet. But when photoreceptor cells are stimulated by light of the wavelengths that they respond to, the photopigment molecules change configuration, and that results in decreasing the inhibitory signals. So now the bipolar cell isn't being told to shut up anymore, and it's able to fire off a signal. I mention this because it's backwards from what we think. We would think like, oh, the photoreceptor cell gets hit with a signal, the right wavelength, it sends off a signal, everybody's happy. But no, actually the photoreceptor cells shut up when they're exposed to the appropriate wavelengths. So, very weird. So it kind of looks like this, this whole thing is just stacked with these discs packed full of the receptors. And when they get hit with, the right wavelength, it changes the configuration of the photopigment, and that changes some ion channels and it stops firing. And you don't need to know the details of this, don't worry about it. Um, but that's how it works for both rods and cones, okay? It just, which wavelengths they respond to depends on that chart I showed you. Now, it might be weird that we have two different types of photoreceptor cells, especially when cones let us see color. Um, rods, because they only have one type of photopigment, 
they're either on or they're off. So that means that we see black and white when our rods are in charge. Rods also only work in fairly dim light. So in bright light, your rods turn off. They're just overwhelmed by the brightness and they're just entirely stunned. So cones are nice because we can see color, um, but they only work in bright light, right? I mean, if you've ever had, if you've ever been trying to look at stuff in very dim light, everything's black and white, right? Because your cones need more light than that to be stimulated. So we have two different kinds so that we have a dim light vision system and a bright light color vision system simultaneously in, our, in the same eyeballs. Um, and then this is, we talked about, I just showed you the chart of this already, um, the three different types of cone pigments. Um, so here's a different one. Um, I think it shows the overlap better. And, oops, um, and I like this because it shows you how the different cones are stimulated at different wavelengths. We don't need to know that for this class, but it's still interesting. Um, so yeah, so rods are really sensitive. But that means that they're really good at providing us with vision in low light conditions, which can totally save your life. Um, but we also don't see as good detail in low light. And that's because there's a hundred rods synapsing on a single ganglion cell. So we're getting kind of big patches of stimulation or no stimulation. Um, cones, we can't see in dim light, but in bright light, we can see color, which is clearly more useful, right? The more colors we can see, the more useful it is um, functionally. They're also faster at reacting than rods, um, and they see better detail because one cone synapses on a single ganglion cell. So this is like the difference between, like, this is like the, rods are like the old school video games with the really big, you know, pixels. Don't make me draw something, but I know you know what I'm talking about. And then cones are like high definition televisions where all the pixels are super, super tiny. So you get really good detail here. Another consequence of the differences between rods and cones is our ability to adapt when we move from bright to dark conditions or vice versa. So light adaptation is our ability to adjust our vision when we go from a dark area to a bright area. So we've all been there, you walk out to a bright area and you're like, oh my God, there's so much light, I'm squinting, and you're waiting for your pupils to constrict, and you're kind of just waiting for your rods to shut up, because basically your rods are like, ah, and they freak out, and then they turn off. Um, it only takes about five to 10 minutes to get full visual acuity as you adapt, and this is because cones are fairly fast, and it's your cones that are suddenly turned on and stimulated and warming up and getting ready to go. Now, dark adaptation is the opposite. Dark adaptation is going from a bright area to a darker area. So you wanna bring in more light so you get rapid pupil dilation, but it takes 20 to 30 minutes to maximize rod function. And that's because your poor rods were hyper stimulated in the bright light. So first they have to like basically cool off from that. They have to recover and gain functionality and they're slow. So the rods have to recover and they're slow at it. So this is why it takes longer to adjust to darkness than it does to adjust to light because of the differences between rods and cones. Okay, so the last thing we want to talk about is the process of sending that light through the optical structures and actually achieving vision. So that was the physiology of how our eyes respond to light, but this is how the light actually behaves. So now we're gonna talk about light retraction and how the optical components of our eye make sure that we're actually getting a focused image on the back of our eye. So light refraction is the fact that light bends when it passes through regions of different densities. Um, and this is most commonly seen in air versus water, right? That's why it looks like the straw moves but it doesn't we know it's continuous we can pull it out and the whole thing goes but because the light bouncing off of this part of the straw is bouncing differently than here this bend makes it look like they're in different places so that's refraction and both our cornea and our lens refract light because they are curved um and so generally speaking um, lenses have a convex shape. So convex is where it's thickest in the center, 
and it sticks out. And so when light comes through, it gets bent inwards and we're making the light all converge on a single point. A thicker lens converges light closer to the lens. So if you had a thinner lens here, then it wouldn't bend it as much. And so the convergence point would be farther away, okay? Um, another thing that happens is as it moves through this double convex lens, the light is actually getting um, inverted. So images that pass through our lens get flipped upside down and backwards. So see how the purple starts back there? It comes through and ends up up here. So that's how images hit the back of our eye because of this light refraction. So they're upside down and backwards and they have to be focused directly on the retina in order for us to have a clear view. Um, now the cornea actually does most of the refraction. And then what the lens does is what we call fine tuning. So the lens is capable of changing its shape, but the cornea isn't. And that's gonna have implications as far as focusing in up close versus far away. Now, as I mentioned before, even though this image is hitting the back of your eye upside down and backwards, your brain flips it back. And it had to learn how to do that in childhood um, based on um, you know, visual information coming in versus sensory information from everywhere else. So a couple more weird examples of image inversion as I tried to find some good ones, and this was the best I got. Um, these are some videos actually that go along with that funky picture I showed you guys last time where you can flip things and people get used to it. So if you're curious, you can take a look there. Um, okay, so like I said, we have to actually focus on the retina. If we focus in front of it or behind it, then things are gonna look blurry. And I'll show you some pictures in a second. Now, the average eye naturally focuses um, when things are about 20 feet away or more. When things are that far away, we don't have to make any additional muscular effort um, by way of our intrinsic eye muscles. So this is mostly by way of the ciliary body um, controlling the lens. So basically our eyes are preset for distance, which makes sense because that's where you know danger is going to come from. And this preset is called emetropia. So the far point of vision is the distance beyond which no changes in lens shape are needed. So that's basically the closest you can see without having to make additional adjustments. So we actually have to put more effort into seeing close than we do with seeing far away. And this 20 feet is why that's how far away we stand when our vision is measured. And it's also why, so somebody at who has 20-20 vision can focus appropriately on things that the average person can see at 20 feet away. 20-20 is actually average, not perfect. Just sad for those of us that don't see very well. Okay, so if you want to look at something closer than 20 feet away, you have to do what's called a near response to vision. So these are all of the adjustments that your eyes make for you to see up close. The most important one is a combination of the lens, which we'll talk about next. But the other things that happen, for example, are pupillary meiosis. So this is where your pupil constricts because you don't need as much light coming in when you're looking at something up close than you do when you're looking at something far away. Like you're literally looking at a smaller area, right? And then the other thing that happens is eye convergence. So those extraocular muscles are literally going to start looking closer and closer, right? So, you know, if you hold a pen as far away as you can, you look at it, right? And you bring it closer, your eyes are actually slowly turning inwards. And that's why if you, you know, for some reason wanted to learn how to cross your eyes, you could just like keep looking at something as you bring it all the way until it's at the tip of your nose, right? And now your eyes are crossed. So that's eye convergence. That's why we can cross our eyes. It's, it's just a consequence of that. Um, the other thing that goes along with this sort of is depth perception. 
So depth perception is our ability to um, judge how far away objects are. It works a lot better with two eyes because with two eyes, we have something called stereoscopic vision. So um, oh, most of what we see with each eye is actually the same thing we see with other eyes. So we call it an overlapping visual field. But our eyes are a little bit far apart, right? So when we look at the same thing with both of our eyes, we're actually seeing it from slightly different angles. Um, and so if there's something else in our visual field, um, we're able to judge the relative distance of objects based on like how, which things we can focus on in any given time. So, you know, if everything at a certain distance is clear, then they must all be the same, dis uh, the same distance from you. So, um, this is just kind of a quick visual about depth perception. Like, I guess it didn't work as well as I was hoping. Anyway, um, where is, hold on. Sorry, I'm gonna go back to that. Um, <clears throat> so, lens accommodation. This should have been next. All right, so the lens is suspended in between the ciliary muscle by these little zonular fibers or suspensory ligaments. And the ciliary muscle can um, constrict. So it's a, it's a sphincter, it's a circular muscle. So if it constricts, it actually moves closer to the lens, right? Because constricting muscles actually tighten down. So when this muscle is relaxed, there's a lot of tension on the zonular fibers because the relaxed muscle is farther away and it's pulling. And when it pulls on the lens, the lens is actually pulled, you know, thinner, it's squished down. And then when the ciliary muscle contracts, it loosens the hold and the lens kind of bounces back and it gets thicker again. So remember a thicker thing is going to um, refract to a focal point closer to it, whereas a thinner thing is going to make it farther away, right? So um, as we're looking at something that's getting closer and closer, we want to change the shape of the lens so that we're able to focus on something at a different distance from us. So um, our emetropia, our like normal state of looking at things at a distance, is with a relaxed ciliary muscle and a flattened lens, okay? Um, and there isn't as much um, refraction that has to happen because the, the rays of light are actually coming in very parallel and so then they just get flipped, whatever you want. When we want to look closer, we need to thicken the lens because this guy being so close, the, the light is actually um, more away. And so we need more refraction to still focus at the same point. And so we're doing that by, of course, um, contracting the ciliary muscle that moves it closer to the lens and that relaxes it and it just kind of automatically bulges. It's got elasticity to it, okay? So that's accommodation. So closer things need more refraction. All right, so that takes us to what happens when that doesn't work, right? So we don't all have this perfect vision. Um, we have issues too. So there's basically two types of issues. Either you're not focusing on the back of your retina or you're not focusing evenly. So there's astigmatism, farsightedness and nearsightedness. So again, this is the normal, right? This is our um, emetropia. So when you're nearsighted, your eyeball is essentially too long for your focal point, which is a weird way to look at it, I think, but that's what's on the diagram. I like to think of it as you're focusing too much, but whatever. So basically you're refracting too much and the focal points here and what's actually hitting the back of the retina is now diverging again. So it looks blurry. So if you wanna fix that, then you want to do less 
focusing. Less convergence of the light, less refraction. So you actually use a concave lens because a concave lens is the opposite of these convex lenses that we've been talking about and it actually diverges the light rather than converges it. And so now when your lens over focuses, it works. So you're essentially using this lens to magnify the images to, um, to a point where you're actually capable of focusing on them, okay? So when you're nearsighted, you have to make the object, the images look nearer to you for your eye to focus on them properly. The opposite is farsightedness or hyperopia. And so with hyperopia, you're not, um, you're not converging enough. So basically the focal point is behind where your eye is, but your eyeball is too short for that. And so you haven't finished focusing when it hits the back of your eye. And so now it's too, um, it, it, it's, it's still blurry. So um, this means like, sure, you're probably fine when you're 60 feet away, but you get up to 20 and it's already too close. So now we have to make the same kinds of accommodations as we would as we're trying to look at things that are closer, right? So now we have to make more convergence to help us make it so that we're focusing by the time we get to the back of the eye. So we're enhancing what we would naturally do here, whereas on the other side of it, we're actually like backstepping a little bit because we're overdoing it. Okay, so we're moving the focal point forward to fix farsightedness. And then the last one's astigmatism. So astigmatism is a little bit different. With astigmatism, um, the cornea doesn't make the light all move on the same plane. And so now instead of a single focal point, we have multiple focal points. And so the consequences of that are that some stuff's in focus and some stuff's not. And so when we get tested for astigmatism, they like to use these kinds of charts. Um, again, not something you should do on a computer. You should do it on a printed out one because they just look bad on here regardless. But um, some of these might look blurry or thicker or thinner. And that would indicate that at that part of your cornea, it's not sending the light through properly. So this is kind of the best visual I've been able to find about what it looks like when you have astigmatism and it depends on which part of your eye has it, how it looks, right? So the blurriness is different. Yeah, I, I have it really mildly actually, um, so I don't have correction for it, but, um, but it's still there. And I think that's why I get light glare at night. Do you have corrective contacts? It helps. I did for a little while and then they were like, it's below the level of, of fixing, but you still have it. And I was like, that's great. I guess that's fine. <laughs> oh, that sucks. All right. So the last thing we want to look at is, oh God. All right, apparently I'm not plugged in. There we go. Um, so the last thing we want to look at is how all this information gets to the brain. So I've mentioned before that some of the visual information has to cross over and some of it stays on the same side. And the reason for that is because we're trying to keep all of the stuff that we're actually seeing from one side. So this is the right visual field. This is actually the right eye, even though it's on our left side. Um, so everything that we see from the right side of our body is gonna hit the um, in, inside of the right eye and the outside of the left eye. And so that all goes to the left side of the brain because remember everything from one side goes on the other side. And then, um, what did I just do? Oh God, what did I do? <sighs> I swear to God. Anyway, um, and then everything from your left visual field 
So it's going to hit the inside of your left eye and the outside of your right eye. And so then it crosses over from the left. And so all of it goes to the right side of your brain. So the reason why we have this half half crossover is that we're keeping everything in each visual field going to the appropriate place. Um, so there's some synapsing in the brain stem. That's where your reflexes are. And then the rest of it is, of course, going to your occipital lobe through your thalamus. Which, oh yeah, there's your thalamus right there. So um, that's how we end up with optic nerves coming out of your eyeballs, optic chiasm, and then your optic tracts um, because there's crossing over. But the funny thing is that technically your optic nerve is is between your bipolar cells in your eye and the ganglion cells. So again, just like with the with the um, olfactory nerve, what we're really looking at is already like your second order neurons. But that's just, you know, it's it's nitpicky stuff and so we don't really worry about it. Okay. Any questions? Sadly, that's it in a nutshell. The worst part is there's so much more and we don't have time to cover it. Um, I will, give, I will end with one more fun fact because I have it on here. So most animals um, have kind of the same vision as uh, people with uh, blue green color blindness. So they have like two types of cones, but they can't see as much spectrum as we can. But we think that the reason we have color vision is because we have ancestors that lived in trees and um, the, the color vision helped us tell the difference between the young nutritious leaves and the older leaves that were more fibrous. Which you wouldn't think that, you'd think it would be to like find fruit or something, but no, apparently it was because young leaves have that lighter green color and older leaves have that darker green color and you need the three cone vision to see it. So that's your last fun fact. All right, I'll see you on Monday. Thanks for coming. See you Monday. All right.